Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit more about quantifiers and um, in particular about the situation in which we have two quantifiers. I think if you can do two, then you can do a whole bunch of them. But the case of where you have two quantifiers is like where you say f there exists something such that for all something or for all something such there exists something or there exists something and there exists something or for all something for all something. So um, let's take a look at the various situations. So um, the case where the two quantifiers are the same is, is not actually that complicated. So let's look, for example, at this statement. Uh, there exists an X in A so that there exists a Y in B so that the open sentence, which depends on both the variables X and Y, is true. So here's a very simple example. There exists X in the natural numbers so that there exists y in the natural numbers, so that x plus y equals 5. And um, if you remember that, that there exists is a little bit like an or statement, um, and you remember that, that or, you can rearrange or, then uh, it's not too hard to see that it doesn't really matter whether we had x and a followed by y and b, or x, y and b followed by x and a. So what does this statement actually say? It says there's some x and some y that add to 5 in the natural numbers. So for example, x equals 2 and y equals 3 is an example. So this shows that the statement is true. And in fact, you could. Um, you could rewrite this differently. You could say there exists a pair, x and y, in the natural numbers cross the natural numbers using the Cartesian product such that x plus y equals 5. And now you're treating x and y kind of on the same footing. And by doing this, you were able to reduce the number of quantifiers from 2 to 1. So I guess the moral of the story is that if you have a sequence of there exists, the order kind of doesn't matter. Because I, if I had said there exists y in n so that there exists x in n so that x plus y equals 5, it would be the same statement. And the same is true if you take for all. Um, so if you're asking for all x in a and for all x in b, something is true. It doesn't matter which order you put the two quantifiers in. So here, here's an example. In the first case, let's look at the first one. So I'm saying for all x and n, all natural numbers x, and all natural numbers y, we have that x, y is positive. And this is a true statement because both x and y are natural numbers, and so they're positive, and so their product is positive. Product of positive numbers is pot. Remember I said you can assume the, uh, the rules of arithmetic here. Okay, what about the second one? Well, the second one's a little bit different. It says for all x in the integers and for all y in the natural numbers, x, y is positive. And this one is false because all to show it's false, all we have to do is show that there's one pair, x and y, for which this isn't true and we could take x equals minus 1 and y equals 1, and then we would have minus 1 times 1 is not bigger than 0. So this is a false statement. But we could have reversed x and y. In other words, I could have said for all y in the natural numbers and for all x in the integers, and it wouldn't have changed the meaning of the statement. And again, here we could have written it in, here the, we could have said for all pairs x, y in n, sorry, z cross n, because x is in z and y is in n, so the order matters, of the, the, the order of the sets matter. But um, I can combine the two for alls into a single for all, 
and just get the statement x, y is bigger than 0. And this is still a false statement, but we've written it in a simpler way using only a single for all. So if you have a chained bunch of for alls or a chained bunch of there exists, you can think of these as you can rearrange them or think of this as just a single for all or a single there exists, but where you're choosing from the Cartesian product. The situation is quite a bit more complicated if the two um, symbols are two uh, quantifiers are different. So let's first look at this one. For all x and a, there exists y and b so that some property p of x, y is true. So here the for all comes first and the there exists comes second. So the first statement that I've given as an example is for all x and n, there exists y in n so that 2y equals x. So this is saying that no matter what x I put on the right-hand side of the equation 2y equals x, provided it's a natural number, I have to be able to find a y so that 2y equals x. This is a false statement because if I choose x equal 5, then it, the statement becomes, so in other words, this inner statement has to be true for all x and n. And this inner statement in particular would have to be true when x equals 5, but the statement there exists y in n so that 2y equals 5, this is false because you can't divide 5 by 2 and get a natural number. The second one, though, says for all x and z, there exists a y in q so that 2y equals x. So again, what that's saying is that this inner sentence, this inner statement, has to be true no matter what x and z you put in. So is it the case that you can solve the equation 2y equals x and get a rational number? And the answer is yes, you can. Namely, you're going to set y to be equal to x over 2, and that's a rational number. So here, remember, to, to, for the inner one to be true, you just have to produce a single y that works. And in this case, there is just one y that works. So this statement is true. I've put this third example here because you may have seen this kind of thing before. These come up all the time in calculus. And you'll notice that it's a for all epsilon in R with epsilon bigger than 0. There exists a delta in R with delta bigger than 0. So that x squared is less than epsilon when x is less than delta. So um, here the two variables are, uh, are epsilon and delta. And um, let's insert a page here. And um, take a look at this. Uh, this statement. So for all epsilon in R epsilon bigger than zero, there is a delta in R delta bigger than zero, so that if x is less than delta, then x squared is less than epsilon. So we again have the for all, and then we have a there exists. And the open sentence that we have inside is an implication. So if you were going to analyze this and write it in a, in a form, if you let p of epsilon delta be the open sentence, um, if x in, it's implicit here that x is, in the, x is in r, but I really should have said it, and absolute value x is less than delta, Sorry. Yes, then x squared is less than epsilon. And we've got a for all epsilon, epsilon in R, epsilon bigger than zero, 
for all delta, delta in R, delta bigger than zero, P of epsilon delta, it gets pretty complicated. I'm not gonna work through this right now, but I just wanted, if you've seen this in calculus, I just wanted to make the connection between um, what you may have seen in the epsilon delta definitions and these paired quantifiers. We'll definitely come back to this later in the course. So let's see, have I covered all of them? I've, for all there exists, what about there, there exists for all? Here we go. So there's also this example um, where, the, uh, where the implications go in the other direction. And in this case, let's look at this example. There exists x and n. Oh, I did that one already, didn't I? No, we didn't. Okay. So there exists x and n so that for all y and n, we have x, y bigger than 1. So this is saying that the statement for all y in n, x, y bigger than 1, that's this inner statement. We have to find an x so that this is true, if we want this statement to be true. Is there an x so that this is true? Well, if x were 2, then it would be the case that for all y in the natural numbers, 2y is bigger than 1. And so this is a true statement. But you notice that we had to find 1x so that the inner statement was true for all y. Whereas in the earlier case, we had to find a y so that for all x, the inner statement was true. What about the second example? There exists x and q so that for all y and q, we have x, y less than y. Well, um, what does it mean to say for all y in q, we have x, y less than y? Is there an x that does that? Well, I don't know. You might think about the following situation. If, um, if you put in x equals, let's look at a few examples. If you put in x equals 0, then that's no good. I mean, if y is positive, then xy, which is 0, is less than y. But if x is negative, if y is negative, then xy is 0 is not less than y. And it's got to work for all y. So that's no good. If x were positive, then x, y is going to be bigger than y if y is positive. And so that's not going to be any good. And if x is negative, then x, y is going to be bigger than y if y is negative. So no matter what x we pick, it's going to go wrong for some y. And so therefore, there's no x that works for every y. So this statement is false. This is a very good one to think about if you're confused about this, because it really shows how you have to think about these things, that you're trying to solve this problem. You're trying to find an x so that x, y is less than x for all y. But it turns out that any x that you try only works for some y. You can't find an x that works for all y. And so the statement is false. OK, and as to conclude this uh, discussion, I wanted to show a couple of um, pictures. So here's the first picture. Uh, my set A, this is supposed to be a coordinate plane here. So let me put the y-axis in. There's the y-axis. So my set A is this strip here, which wiggles um, uh, through the coordinate plane. And you can assume that it goes off to negative infinity in this way and, and out to positive infinity that way. 
And if you look at the statement here where the for all comes first, for all x in R, there exists y in R so that the point x, y is in A. Let's think about this. Is it the case that no matter what x we pick, so for instance, if we pick this one, there's a y so that the point x, y is in A. This is, ask, this is going to be true if above every point on the x-axis there's at least one above or below, at least one point in the set A. And by the way I've drawn this, you can see that this is true. So basically what when you write it this way, what you're asking is, does your set stretch all the way across the axis so that any vertical line hits it? On the other hand, let's look at if we reverse the there exists and the for all. Here we've said, there. so my set now is this kind of wiggly thing, but it's vertical. And now I'm asking the statement, if this statement is true, there exists x in R so that for all y in R, we have x, y, and a. So now the question is, is there a single point x on the x-axis so that no matter which y I pick, the point xy lies in my set. And I've tried to draw the x for which this works. But you'll notice, for example, that, that this x here, use a different color, this x here doesn't work because this is it's not true that for all y, the points xy lie in the set A. These points here don't lie in the set A. So um, you could easily imagine how this could go wrong. For example, if the set, if I couldn't squeeze a vertical line all the way through the set because somehow it bent in too much and so I always hit the boundary, then this would be false. Whereas up here, if somehow this set, let's say it made a sharp U-turn and headed back this way so that it didn't, it, there was nothing above or below a point over here, then this would be false. So you see, reversing the for all and there exists really changes the geometry of what you're looking at. In one case, you're looking for one point for which the vertical line stays entirely in the set. And in the other case, you're looking for whether or not for each point, there is a point above or below it, which lies within the set. Okay, I hope that helps a little bit in uh, making sense of paired quantifiers.